good to see you here. And you will speak about hydronic interactions at ultra high energies. Now the floor is yours. Go ahead, please, Lorenzo. Okay, thank you very much. And I thank you, the organizer, for uh, having invited me. And I'm very sorry I cannot be there with you. I, this is uh, some health issues. But anyway, so this is my talk. I will speak about hadronic interactions at ultra high energies with extensive air showers. So this first transparency uh, shows the, the scope of my talk. I don't know if you can see the pointer. I hope you can see the pointer. Can you? Yeah, OK. I, I assume you can. So nature uh, goes from the uh, microscopic wall from the interactions. It builds extensive air showers. And then we have detectors that detect these showers. Uh, the physics point of view, or at least the experimentalist point of view, is that we we take the detectors, we make measurements, we build, uh, we reconstruct the extensive air showers, not with all the information, with the some subsamples of information, and we want to learn uh, things about the uh, basics of those interactions. And my object of study, my specialization is uh, extensive air showers. And uh, for, for a complete review on this topic and on the problems of uh, hadronic physics with extensive air showers, the muon puzzle, and many other things you can you have here, this uh, reference, uh, which is a very complete uh, review on that. So extensive air shower, uh, this is a picture uh, of a a cartoon picture of, a, of an extensive air shower where we have the first interaction and then we have a multiplicative process which reach up, uh, up to 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13th particles and interactions. I'm thinking about a shower of 10 to the 19th, uh, so well uh, above the ultra high energy uh, regime. So this, so we go basically for from uh, as an assembly of information of, of the order of uh, 10 to the 12 independent observables, uh, sorry, variables, to at most perhaps 10 independent observables. This is what we can learn from the extensive air showers. We can measure things which are macroscopic. We cannot measure, measure things which are microscopic or we could at the end of the shower, right, with particle detectors. But for the object as a whole, or for the extensive air shower, we can measure up of the order of 10 independent variables. So the question, the, the basic question we wonder is how much information about the mass of the primary and interactions of the primary is possible to recover. And in particular, obviously, from the first interaction, which is the most interesting one, because it's well above the LHC, this is well above the energies reached by man-made accelerators. This is very interesting. So we go now, let, let me explain uh, you now that what is the basics of the, of the air shower as a, as, a, as a feedback and as a coupling of different showers. So basically we have, when the cosmic rays enter the atmosphere, we have hadronic interactions uh, then we have mostly many pions, baryons, and uh, some other mesons. Um, many of the uh, many of these mesons, mainly the, the pies, the charged pies, reinteract again. So this is self-sustained uh, cascade, which is the hadronic cascade. Sometimes, or one third of the times, the pi seed or one of the the, the mesons decay and produce uh, they feed the electromagnetic cascade, which is self-sustained, right? And when the, when the charge pions have low energy, when they don't have enough energy to interact again, they produce muons. So muons will be the tracers of the hadronic cascade. And then the electromagnetic cascade will, can be seen because they emit uh, radiation through the interaction with the atmosphere. But the, most of the information we will get of the hadronic cascade is by means of muons. So these are, the hadronic cascade is the main engine of the whole cascade. 
and we have two cascades which are coupled, the electromagnetic and the, and the Hadron cascade. In the first interaction, uh, I, I show here a pie chart of the different particles produced in the first interaction. So this is a pie chart of the multiplicity for the uh, for the uh, for one of the models, which is uh, one of the uh, state of the art models after being uh, tuned by the latest LHC data. So we see in, in shades of blue we see uh, the hadronically interacting particles. So most of them. Most of the multiplicity comes from pions. Then we have uh, some kaons and some barriers. Okay, and it's practically the same. Practically the same for pair interactions and uh, pair and kaon interactions. Uh, approximately one third or uh, one fourth of the uh, multiplicity goes to pi zeros and to charge. Uh, sorry, to uh, photons and, and electrons. When we jumped to the energy fraction, the picture is more or less the same, but we see, so this is the sum of the energy carried by the secondaries. We see that the, uh, that the variance are a, a bit more important. It's reduced the fraction of all the other particles and variance become more important for the three type of interactions, protonaire, uh, pioneer, and kaoner. These two, the pioneer and the kaoner interactions are uh, typical interactions after the first interaction, which happen in the development of the shower. So I, it's important to think, uh, typically people think of uh, multiplicities when they think about the growth of the electromagnetic cascade and when they think uh, of the uh, full cascade and when they think of the how it behaves but it's more important the energy fraction taken by the by the particles because this is what governs the coupling of the electromagnetic and the hadronic cascade and in this uh, this equation here we can see that the fraction of energy uh, kept into the hadronic cascade after each inter interaction is basically the multiplication of the fraction of this energy after each generation. So the fraction of energy after n generations is basically the, uh, the multiplication of the fraction of the single generations, which is this value is typically around in between two thirds and three fourths, more or less. And here we can see this is the evolution of this fraction of the particle uh, of the number of generations and we can see that the here in this in this corner of the of the uh, picture, it would be the energy kept into the hadronic cascade. This would be the electromagnetic energy, and we see that after two or three generations, most of the energy is already transferred to the electromagnetic cascade. So the energy is building up to 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 the electromagnetic cascade and is getting uh, out of the hadronic cascade. So after two or three generations, the hadronic and the electromagnetic cascade are decoupled. And we can conclude from here also that the electromagnetic cascade is sensitive to high energy physics, whereas the hadronic cascade is more sensitive to the, uh, the observations we do on the hadronic cascade is more sensitive to the high and low energies because the minions are produced at the very end of the hadronic cascade, whereas most of the information we get from the electromagnetic cascade is driven by the first interaction because it's the contribution, is the greatest contribution to the energy. And here we can see in the right side, we can see the evolution of the electromagnetic cascade for an assemble of iron showers, and we can see the evolution of the tracers of the electromagnetic cascade. So this is the, the positions or the depth where the muons are produced and the muons are produced after the pion decay. So this is the tracer of the hadronic cascade and this is, the tra uh, this is directly the uh, electromagnetic cascade. And then we can define the maximum of the electromagnetic cascade, which we know is sensitive to the mass composition, but also we can define the maximum of the hadronic uh, tracers or the maximum of the muon production depth, which is also sensitive to composition, but it's also sensitive to other stuff because uh, we will see 
what problems this, this has. And well, this is just a, car uh, a cartoon of, the, of what I said. So we have to distinguish between the muon production depth distribution. So this is the, the, how the muons are produced. So this is the hadronic cascade, but the cumulative of this cascade is basically the total number of muons. So the number of muons is being produced, is being accumulated, and some of them disappear because of decay. So this would be the profile of the total number of muons. In a sense, this would be this number would be equivalent to this number, whereas this one is the differential of the of this cumulative, obviously. So um, let's see how the different uh, how the uh, hadronic parameters uh, impact the development of the of the shower so um, this work was uh, done by Ralph Ulrich and some and, and some colleagues uh, already more than 10 years ago and by a smooth um, by, by a smooth uh, um, variation of basic parameters which are the uh, cross section the multiplicity and the elasticity and the fraction of pi zeros he could study by, by a smooth uh, change, uh, which is depicted like that. So the, it's kept at low energy, so there is no variation. And then it, at smooth function changes the evolution above this energy threshold. You, you cannot introduce a sudden change. So you can study what is the impact, for instance, in the number of muons and in X max. So in X max, for instance, the cross section changes the X max a lot. Of course, we know it. And for the number of millions, for instance, if you change the fraction of pi zeros, then you put more uh, uh, more hadronic uh, particles, then you also change the number of millions. Oops, this is not changing. Oh. One of the things, uh, one of the direct measurements, and this is related to the previous transparency because it was uh, basically the, the, the use the same function to modify the, the, the cross section. One of the direct measurements that can be done with uh, earth showers is the proton air cross section. So by moving uh, the cross section in a smooth way, you change the tail of the X max, the depth, the deep tail of the X max distribution. And by making an inverse map, we can reconstruct. So we can compare with actual observations, which are here, and we can obtain the actual cross section. So which is uh, here for different cosmic ray experiments. And we see that it agrees more or less well with the uh, expectations from different hadronic models. This was a few quick, uh, a quick uh, uh, reminder of this measurement. But uh, some other parameters, like the ones I said, the elasticity, the energy fraction going into pions, they have, for instance, here we have the energy fraction kept in the hadronic cascade. We see that there is quite room in between the different, the shadow region is the difference, uh, the, the, the allowed uh, space, uh, space in between different hadronic models. We see that there is some uncertainty. Also for the cross section, there is little uh, less dependence for the inelasticity. And sorry, this was the cross section and this is the This is the multiplicity and this was the cross section, sorry. So there is some uh, room, the, the models have some room for, uh, uh, they don't have a, a straight, uh, they don't coincide in the predictions and this introduces some, some uncertainties in the prediction of the main observables of the showers. So the electromagnetic shower is very, is very well understood and this translates into X max being the, the, the observable which is being used for mass inference. But the muons, they have lots of room uh, variation from model to, to model. They have large model uncertainties. And this, uh, this is the reason why typically muons are less trusted to, to build, uh, to reconstruct the mass composition of, of, of cosmic rays. In regarding the distributions observed at ground, both the electromagnetic and the muon uh, components show universal uh, characteristics, which I will show here. For instance, 
This is the electromagnetic uh, shower profile. This is uh, when we shift the electromagnetic profile, uh, everything to the same, uh, to, to the, uh, when we plot X minus X max, we see that the, <clears throat> the predictions and the observations are coincide very well, except in this region, very close to the startup of the shower. And this is where the, the decoupling of the electromagnetic and the hadronic cascade starts. And this can be used, in fact, to extract some information about the injection of pi zeros. But unfortunately, well, this is a, a paper published by the Pierre Auger Observatory. And this is this parameter R, which uh, measures basically this velocity of this uh, of the of the geyser hillas startup. Uh, the difference between proton and iron. This is uh, the two uh, primaries. We see that there is no enough uh, precision yet to distinguish between them. But in principle, uh, this could be possible if we have the better instrumentation in the future. For the rest of the shower, the shape is very, very universal. The shape of the uh, muon uh, distributions are produce, uh, production is also very universal. Here we have the muon production depth. So this is uh, the depth of production minus reference to the maximum. So all the showers are this place to make the maximum coincide is very uh, universal. There are some differences in detail, but the bulk of production is uh, very universal. Then we have the PT. The PT, look at this is the logarithmic scale. So it's very uh, exaggerated. Perhaps the, the bulk of the muons have a very universal PT distribution. And then we have the production spectrum of muons, which is, uh, between the three, among the three, this is the less universal of the three uh, distributions when we compare the different hadronic models. And this will have some importance in the things that I will explain later on. So let's jump now to the to measurements. So one of the first measurements, uh, which this was a work done by the Pierre collaboration, we can compare we can make a, uh, we can measure the maximum of the muon production depth is a technique which uses the timing, right, the arrival time of the muons because they uh, travel in a straight line. So you can make a geometrical reconstruction of the production point and you can make plot at the same time, the depth of the electromagnetic uh, shower. So we have here the Auger point and we have here the predictions of uh, all the compositions in between iron and proton, iron and proton for two uh, hadronic models. So all the possible compositions are here at this energy at 10 to 19.4. And we see that there is a difference with respect to predictions. And we believe that the, the problem comes from the X new max, because as I said, we trust more for composition the prediction of X max. So probably X mu max, the production depth of uh, muons is, is wrong, is wrongly predicted by models. So there were some investigations of what happened, what was wrong in the predictions from in the physics by models. And there might be some problems with the baryon production, with the pioneer diffraction, and also with the uh, kion and pion energy spectrum, which change the velocity where the somehow they change the velocity in how the hadronic cascade builds up, how it grows. So this is uh, some implications for the something has to be changed, but the feedback, I mean, it's not clear which one of these are the dominant and there is still some work to do. On the other hand, there is also a big feedback in between the X mu max and X max, a big change, a large change. When you change these parameters, a large change happens in the X mu max and a small change happens in X max. So there is some feedback between these two variables which can be taken in where we can take advantage of to, to improve 
the predictions for mass compositions and also for understanding the hadronic uh, physics. And now, one of the most important results, which are the results of the working group on hadronic interactions and shower physics, which is the is a meta analysis of the uh, muon surface densities of uh, nine experiments, which were very different experiments in different uh, conditions of uh, semi tangle distance to the core and also energy threshold. Uh, so the, we, we have to put them, uh, the group had to put them together and make a comparison to check if there was a problem reported uh, to confirm whether or not there was a problem uh, uh, given uh, that was measured by other experiments on the number of muons compared to predictions. So this new scale was created, which is Z, which is the relative number of the number of muons uh, compared to the predictions of proton and then divided by the relative difference between iron and proton. So this is a number that goes between zero and one. Zero, if, is, if it coincides with the proton predictions, the, num the same number of muons as in proton and one, if you measure the same number of muons as an uh, iron shell. So the experiments, as I said, were very different. So, uh, so we have some experiments like uh, Auger, which have a shower energies measured in an optical telescopes and the muon density is measured in surface detector. We have Auger, Amiga, which is a part of Auger, TA and Jakutsk. Then we have the shower energy, uh, some experiments which measure the shower energy in the surface detector. And then they measure the, uh, the muon content with a surface detector like Ice Cube and Agasa. Then we have experiments which measure the electron density, and then they measure the muon content with the surface detector. The muon content is always measured with the surface detector. There is no other way. What changes is basically how you measure the electromagnetic component and how you get the energy scale of your experiment. So we have Cascade Grande and EAS MSU, and then we have experiments which basically only measure the muon content, like never the cot and sugar. So this is the result. So there is one plot for each single uh, uh, model because the comparison, uh, I didn't say, but this comparison has to be done. The number of muons is compared to the predictions of a given model. And in the denominator, it's given by, a, it's a, the predictions given by a, a model so it has this comparison has to be made model by model so we have this picture for the uh, old models and the new models after the lhc so there is a bit scatter it's a bit uh, chaotic but when we make the energy rescaling of the different experiments and we do that by comparing the energy spectrum and allowing a freedom of the energy scale so we match the energy scale and it doesn't matter much what what is the scale uh, but the, the important thing is that we make a relative shift a relative shift on all these scalings and here is uh, are the the scalings we have to apply we uh, we use this common energy scale between og and ta because of uh, historic reasons and then we see that the picture improves a bit the models the data points align so the color points are the predictions, are the measurements of the different experiments. And in gray is the, um, the number of muons pre, uh, that uh, the given composition, the measured composition would give in this uh, hadronic uh, interaction model. So it's seen clearly here, okay? So an access uh, would be comparing, not comparing the, the, the measurements with the proton or iron light, or iron line, sorry, it would be the comparison of the, of the measurement with respect to what this given composition uh, would give in terms of number of muons. So we can do that for the two, these two hadronic models. Where this is where we have most of the data and we subtracted the Z, measured Z minus the Z predicted uh, assuming a, a given mass, which was uh, measured by, uh, by the different uh, experiments. And this is what we obtain. So and we, if we make a fit of this line, we see 
that the uh, slope of this fit using different uh, statistical techniques and different uh, uh, to see if this uh, this was an artifact or this was significant enough uh, the correlation coefficient between the different models and was checked uh, uh, some of the some of the experiments were uh, removed from the sample to see if this uh, trend was still observable so it survived all the checks and we see that the significance of the slope is above eight sigma so it's a, it's completely confirmed and we can see that the discrepancy or the mean what is being called uh, the mean puzzle starts around 10 to the 16 and reaches uh, uh, to the highest standards with a large excess on the number of mean Within this group, it was also uh, checked because we have different experiments with different energy thresholds and different uh, working at different zenith angles. So when you compare showers with different zenith angles, you, you can also assume that there's a, a different energy threshold for muons because the, shower, the, the atmosphere is uh, uh, added uh, matter that cuts low energy muons. So if it was a, there was some, uh, it could be observed some dependency with the energy spectrum of muons. So there was no found, found no evidence of discrepancy uh, on the energy of the, of, of the energy spectrum of the muons. So there was found no problem uh, using this data. But Cascade Grande reported that the attenuation of the number of muons as a function of the zenith angle was different from uh, expectations. So it's, uh, so neons probably have a larger attenuation length, so a harder energy spectrum. And if you remember in one of my first slides, the energy spectrum is one of the uh, basic uh, production distributions, which has more uncertainties in the prediction of the model. So this is something that we also have to keep an eye on. And there will be, uh, quite interesting physics uh, in in the short uh, future. So the reasons for this uh, for this uh, mean energy spectrum, these differences is perhaps because of the difference in the meson production uh, in the energy spectrum of the meson production. Also, be, perhaps there are differences in the uh, pion and kaon ratio in the shower. Given that kaon and pion they have different energy spectrum if you change the ratio if the real ratio is different then you will serve a mismatch in data the transverse momentum distribution and i'm speaking about the bulk of particles which is below 2 gv so there is no deviations with respect to uh, universal expectations from the model so this is a very robust uh, quantity um, and I insist I speak here about the PT below 2 GV because uh, the, the, there are studies uh, and measurements above this uh, for high PT and you can uh, see them in this uh, in this review and there you can examine uh, you can see that there is interesting physics there and in fact there are some deviations with respect to predictions but not for the bulk of particles belonging to the energy shower and for the bulk of particles which are measured in in cosmic ray uh, in cosmic ray uh, arrays and then it was uh, so if we not only uh, measure the average number of muons if we want to examine the fluctuations the shower to flux to shower fluctuations of the number of muons we can see that this correlates very well with the first interaction because the number of muons is basically the the, the multiplication of the uh, basically the number of muons is the multiplication of the multiplicities of all interactions also is the is the factor is the multiplication of the different energy fractions and then normalized by the total energy to the critical energy but we found so it was found in this publication that the thing that best correlates with the total number of muons in shower to shower fluctuations is a quantity which is in right in between this alpha which is the sum of the is the energy fraction to the power of beta and beta is the exponent where the that describes the growth of the number of muons with showers and this is uh, beta is 0 0.93 uh, so practically practically this alpha is 
in most cases it can be taken as the energy fraction of the kept into the hadronic cascade and this is where we find more the most correlations and if we allow these quantities the, if the total number of muons is the multiplication of these quantities and these quantities fluctuate shower by shower we can observe that the total fluctuations of the number of muons is the sum of the fluctuations of all these factors but then we and we can we can see that the fluctuations of this contribution to F2 to Fn are suppressed by the number of participants because the shower is growing. So the fluctuations get narrower and narrower because you have more uh, participants. It grows as the, as the multiplication of the multiplicities grows, as the shower grows. So basically, we can see that 70% of the fluctuations come from the fluctuations of the first interaction of the energy fraction of the first interaction. And then we can see that, for instance, if showers which uh, no pi decay where we kept with no pi zero decay, where we get all the energy is kept into hadronic uh, uh, component of the shower, then we don't have basically fluctuations. And this can be used to put limits in Lorentz invariance violation because if the pi zero decay would be suppressed. <clears throat> So the, uh, here I report, and I'm, I'm about to finish. Here I'm reporting on the measurements of the fluctuations of the of the number of muons uh, done by Pierre Auger. And here, uh, so these are the measurements, and these are the predictions of the uh, for different hadronic models given the composition, which is measured, and the, we see no discrepancy. So it means that the description of the fluctuations of energy fraction in the first interaction is well described. And this indicates that there is no large, probably there is no large deviations in the first interaction. So the problem with the number of muons is probably accumulation, a small accumulation of a mismatch over, uh, over the different uh, generations. And this is what it has been studied in this series of articles. So if we introduce a small deviation on the energy fraction in different uh, interactions, for instance, a 5% deviation, and we count six generations, which is the typical number for a 10 to the 19 uh, shower, this accumulates to a 30% deviation in the number of muons. So small deviations can produce a large deviation on the number of muons. And this plot here shows the uh, prediction of X max uh, with respect, and here is the number of muons. Here we see the Auger uh, point. And these are, the, these are the predictions for proton and iron. And then in these articles, they moved the energy fraction up and down, the energy fraction in the first, second, and third interaction, interaction but with uh, decreasing the importance of this uh, uh, with a smooth, it was not a constant change along all the interactions. It was a change most important for the first interaction, less important for the second, and so on. And they 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 see that it's possible to get to the to the data point of self biogen. So the muon puzzle. So this is an indication that the muon puzzle can be solved by increasing the fraction of energy going to the hadronic uh, cascade, and then there is. Uh, many models in the market, for instance, the stream percolation, the strange fireball, the chiral symmetry restoration. Then there is the core corona and uh, uh, the core corona, which is quark with gluon plasma formation in this in, in this reference. And here you can see that it's possible to reproduce the results of WISP uh, with uh, quite uh, with values of this effect, which are quite uh, okay. And for instance, this other work here is the, for the violation of uh, uh, Lorentz invariance. And then we, I mean, we, you can increase, I mean, if you forbid uh, in, in the Lorentz invariance violation, if you for, uh, forbid the decay of pi zeros, uh, this would be one of the effects of this uh, uh, invariance violation then the number of, of muons would increase, but then you would decrease a lot the fluctuation of the number of muons because you would saturate 
the hadronic shower, so you don't have room for fluctuations. The fluctuations come from the uh, fluctuations on energy going to electromagnetic or hadronic shower, and then you would enter in conflict with the measurement of the muon fluctuations, and this can be used to put limits on the Lorentz invariance violation. Then, uh, one of the, my last comments is that uh, we need to go to the full, to study the full uh, distribution of the number of muons, and this is also resulted uh, by the Pierre Auger Observatory. So this is, these are the raw measurements of different energy beams, and in blue are the uh, physical fluctuations after subtracting the uh, detector uncertainties. And in principle, we could be we would be able to observe a distribution that is like this. We are not yet at this moment, but in the future, we will be able to get something like this. For the moment, we are using the average value of the number of muons and also the fluctuations, but we would be able to study the tails of the distributions and the full distribution in detail, which has lots of information on the uh, hadronic interactions very, at very high energies. And this is an example of that. Uh, so this is the these are the distribution of number of muons for proton showers, and we can observe that if we change the energy spectrum of pi zero production in the first interaction, we change the tail of this distribution. Uh, so these are uh, shower to shower fluctuations. So if we change the uh, the spectrum of pi on, pi zero production this will affect the muon content of the whole shower. So we can extract also measurements of uh, from the first interaction. And Five then, minutes left. Yes. This is my last transparency and then it's conclusions. And then there is a tantalizing uh, possibility, which was has been reported in the last is very uh, conference and also in the last ICRC, uh, and these are preliminary results by OJ, it looks like the best fit to describe the uh, distribution of X max and signal uh, in the surface detector. Uh, if you allow some freedom to move the X max, a rigid a shift in X max from the models, you would obtain a much better fit. So it looks like the model's data is in tension with the models and wants the models to shift a positive shift in X max, which is quite uh, unexpected. And this would change the composition. And of course, it would have uh, profound implications for the understanding of the hadronic models, but the results are yet preliminary. And here we see the prediction of the hadronic models and this we see in, in dark uh, solid uh, lines is the results of this uh, study, what the model should look like to have a better fit. Oops, sorry. And then the conclusions is that the, there are important differences in model extrapolations so for proton air and pion air. And the uh, proton oxygen would be important in the next LHC measurements. Uh, X max is the less model dependent of the all the observables is used used to measure the proton air cross sections and is the reference observable for mass composition. So X mu max is sensitive to the cascading velocity to the hadronic cascading velocity, and among the explanations for this uh, for the mismatch uh, in compared to models is there is the pioneer diffraction this is one of the main uh, reasons and also the barium production there are strong indications of harder mean spectrum in the in data compared to models and the the mean puzzle this is the most important result so far is uh, the mismatch uh, is confirmed with more than eight sigma by the WISP group which is collecting uh, results of more of nine experiments. Uh, and the muon puzzle starts at very low energy, at 10 to the 16. But it looks like this effect is cumulative uh, and it can be explained by an increase of the hadronic energy fraction over different stages of the shower starting at 10 to the 16. So, 
So the, the, this is the, the, this is confirmed. I mean, what I said is also supported by the findings of the uh, fluctuations of the number of muons, which coincide with predictions. And then the last point is that we we have to go to study the whole uh, muon distributions, and there will be much more information about Hadernet physics when we can reconstruct the full distributions with all uh, details. And I will stop here.